Good morning, and welcome to the third session of the 2020 Champlain Institute at College of the Atlantic. My name is Lynn Bolger, and I am the College of the Atlantic's Dean of Institutional Advancement, as well as one of the organizers of this event. I want to thank IDS International for being a corporate sponsor of the Institute and for all those who support COA's mission. When we decided on this year's theme, November 3rd, What's at Stake, we didn't quite know how surreal and historic a year it would be. Okay, so the murder hornets, they turned out to be non-news, but I think we can all agree that 2020 so far has been a kicker. COVID, of course, we talked about that last session in depth, but hey, remember Brexit? Breakfast, Brexit was this February. And the devastating Australian wildfires, the President of the United States was impeached this year in February. Armed protesters stormed Michigan's state capitol in May protesting the pandemic shutdown. Harvey Weinstein is in jail, Michael Flynn, Roger Stone, and Michael Cohen are out. Then there is the before and after line of the murder of George Floyd, America's line in the sand regarding our reckoning with racial injustice, which led, of course, to protests in cities from Bar Harbor, Maine, to Portland, Oregon, and oh boy, Portland, Oregon. It's hard to imagine the country more divided, but of course it has been more divided more than once in our 200 year experiment in self-governance, but never more so than during the Civil War. And to discuss that time in our history and what we can learn from it, we have not one but three Lincoln scholars here with us this morning. Philip Coonhart III is a COA alumnus and a trustee emeritus, and he has recently retired as distinguished scholar in residence in the humanities at New York University. Philip taught history and biography at NYU's College of Arts and Science, and before that was a Bard Center Fellow at Bard College. He has co-authored six books, including The Photographs of Abraham Lincoln, Looking for Lincoln, and The American President, and has written and co-produced historical documentaries for PBC, ABC, HBO, Discovery, and other networks. Welcome, Philip. Hello, all. And thanks to Lynn Bolger and Darren Collin and all my friends at College of the Atlantic for hosting this exciting program as part of the Champlain Society. I'm Philip Coonhart, and I've been asked to introduce today's conversation. I was one of the first students to attend College of the Atlantic. I'm the proud father of a COA graduate. I was a longtime trustee of the college, now emeritus, and I've written books and films on Abraham Lincoln. And I'm also a big fan of Jamie McCowan and of Ted Widmer. I like books that take a compressed period of time and not only go deeply into a brief chronology, but manage at the same time to shed light on an entire era. In Lincoln on the Verge, Ted Widmer writes with clarity and verve, but he also sees into the truth of things in an almost Lincolnian way. He understands the moral realm that Lincoln believed needed to be at the nation's core. As we watch Lincoln grow during his 13-day journey east from Springfield to Washington, reaching heights of political eloquence at the Liberty Hall in Philadelphia, we are reintroduced to the America of 1861, deeply divided and perched on the edge of civil war. In an interesting way, we're also introduced to the northern states through which Lincoln's special train passed. One learns about the importance of Cincinnati, the queen city of the West, about the upward jutting spur of the then state of Virginia, 
rising almost as far north as New York City, about Ohio's Lakeside Western Reserve, once known as the New Connecticut. The book sparkles with small insights, a black dress given to his stepmother by Lincoln before the journey, hints that the two of them were already in mourning. An icy river the president-elect must cross on his way home from visiting her suddenly becomes his Rubicon. Lincoln's farewell address to his friends at Springfield is revelatory. He knows when to be strong, but also when to be vulnerable, even spiritual, with his listeners. Widmer is a master of metaphor. Lincoln's railroad car becomes a deus ex machina, and for a time seems to represent the ship of state itself, moving like Odysseus's craft over the river of fate. When an unscheduled halt due to a stalled car up the tracks leaves Lincoln temporarily stranded in a small New York State town called Freedom, Widmer imagines the taunting headlines. Lincoln stuck in freedom. Niagara Falls feels like the strong force of democracy, powerful and essential, but potentially dangerous in the hands of a demagogue. Lincoln's secret night train into Washington, a city of monuments which Whitmer calls a kind of necropolis, is like crossing through Edgar Allan Poe's Plutonian darkness, which Whitmer calls the River of Night. Just getting there alive has been an enormous accomplishment, thanks to the actions of many. While keeping his focus on 1861, Ted can't help but shed light on our own times, where selfishness and criminality have once again infected our political system, and where racism appears in the highest places. In Lincoln's time, the Confederacy was being created in order to ensure white supremacy. And all the while, under President Buchanan, the nation stood by and allowed it to happen. Lincoln was part of a great social revolt to reclaim the nation's higher ideals, to move history forward in a new and better way. He was lifted up by this political and social movement but he also led it. Widmer understands that only the pivotal time it was, but also our own terrible challenges today. It is my pleasure to introduce our two speakers, Ted Widmer and Jamie McCown. I've known Jamie since he arrived at the college as a young, much needed professor of history. Today he is the college's Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and the James Russell Wiggins Chair of Governance and Polity. Jamie has taught at several institutions, including Northwestern, the College of Charleston, Loyola, and Emory University, and he worked for a number of years as a political consultant for various campaigns across the country. A Lincoln scholar who has published extensively on 19th century American rhetoric social movements, and public discourse, he is the perfect interlocutor for today's conversation with our special guest. I met Ted Widmer 10 years ago at a Lincoln Prize dinner in New York City. He was then serving as the director of the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University. Before that, he taught for years in Harvard's History and Literature program was involved in the launching of George magazine and served as a foreign policy specialist for President Bill Clinton for four years. I won't elaborate on an earlier incarnation as a rock musician in a popular Boston band called the Upper Crust, where he was affectionately known as Lord Rockingham. After Brown, Ted became a professor of history at Washington College in Cheshire, Maryland where he ran the C.B. Starr Center for the Study of the American Experience. 
More recently, he served as senior advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And in 2016 and 17, he directed the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. The author of four books on American history, he is a contributing writer to the New York Times, as well as many other papers and magazines. And he was the director of the Times' Disunion column and of its prize-winning series on the year 1919. Since 2018, he's been teaching at the Macaulay Honors College of the City University of New York. It is with great pleasure that I welcome now Ted Widmer and Jamie McCown. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Um, I want to thanks for coming and, and being with us again, Ted. It's My pleasure, fantastic. Jamie. And to talk about your book, um, I want to cut right into and, and begin in the beginning. In a way, um, I think both you and I have talked about before that it's there's probably very few political figures in U.S. history that have been written about or studied more than Abraham Lincoln. Yet, despite that, there are these I don't want to say gaps, but areas that are kind of stand in the shadows, right? So. People will focus on the 1858 debates and then get into the 1860 election and then, you know, Cooper, obviously Cooper Union, and, and then we get to the presidency. But this period in particular that your book focuses on, this period basically between his election and especially in the, the weeks leading up to his trip to Washington, D.C., to his inauguration, you know, as I was reading the book, I realized that not a lot has been really written about that. And so I'm curious, just as a starting point, how did this topic come up for you? How did this project get started? What was the impetus for it? Well, thank you, Jamie. It's so nice to be talking with you. I think we are, in a way, living in the years 1859, 60, 61, maybe to an unhealthy degree. And I, I also just want to say that was a very beautiful introduction by Phil Coonhart, and I'm so appreciative of it. He's obviously read the book really carefully. And I just want to give a shout out to him and to his family because their work over many generations profoundly influenced me, including the visual part of this story. They gathered a lot of the most important Lincoln photographs. And this is a visual book as well as a, a, a textual book. Um, so I'm just grateful to Phil and all his family have done, including I think I might have learned to read from the book Pat the Bunny by his great aunt, Dorothy um, Meserve. So uh, anyway, I'm just that was a great introduction. I can't wait to catch up with Phil later. So if this book reads a little better than some of the other history books I've written, it's because I, I removed myself from my academic training. And I think, I mean, you and I have both been trained as academics, but I wanted to tell a bit of a better story. And how academics approach a story is, is something we might take some time to think about. But I was writing in the Disunion series for the, for the Times, which Phil mentioned, and um, I, there was a time in February 2011 where I was looking around for things that happened 150 years earlier. That was the conceit of the series, and I, I saw that Lincoln took a long train ride, and I thought that is a perfect topic for um, a series of posts once a day. I can just talk about where he went on that day on the train. I, I like trains a lot anyway, and so I thought this is a, an unusual setting to put Lincoln into. I can describe what he's thinking about that day, what speeches he's making, what the city is like, and move him along over 13 days. And so it began very simply as an online history blog. And I think the fact that it was online made it a little looser too. So it began uh, in a relaxed way, which is not how we academics usually think. And I think, you know, it, it became less relaxed when I had to do deep research and it took me a long time, but, um, by starting out relaxed, I was able to tell a story from beginning to end, and that helped. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing about where you where you start from um, and also kind of the, trying to find the right voice for it, right? Because I do agree with you that in many respects, what you've written here is a narrative that kind of encapsulates not just Lincoln, but also what's going on in the country and various kind of refractions of it at the particular time. And in that very particular window, you, you write very early on that in this period right after Lincoln is elected, there is this period you describe, and I think it's even a chapter title as waiting for Lincoln, as if the country was holding their breath 
Um, and I'm, I, I, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that because one of the things I was I had not considered was that he had to figure out when he would travel to Washington, right? So there's a four month period there. And so you kind of describe, these would be my words, kind of a Goldilocks situation of you don't want to leave too soon. You don't want to Absolutely leave too late. Right. What was the calculus? I mean, why was that just simple when I traveled to DC for the inauguration going to be such a huge question for him? You know, someone asked me last night, what, what was my favorite chapter? And I, I mentioned that chapter is possibly my favorite, even though it's only chapter two and the, the drama increases toward the end. And I, I like the drama and I like the, you know, the, the main drama is Lincoln trying not to be killed. And so that drama increases. But I liked describing Washington as a festering cesspool that is literally toxic because of the poisonous rivers that flow through it. Um, but is toxic in every other sense, politically toxic a, as well. And as I studied it very carefully in these months that you have looked at quite carefully, so he's elected in no, early November, 1860, and in late November, and then throughout the month of December, the country is falling apart, but the city of Washington is really falling apart too. And there are people pushing each other off sidewalks. Um, senators and congressmen will walk around each other to avoid saying hello. And there is a, a plot brewing. There, there, there are many plots brewing, but not only is there fear, justifiable fear that Lincoln will be killed if he tries to take office, but there are armed militias like we've seen throughout 2020, armed militias pro-Southern militias pat patrolling the streets of Washington and rumors flying around that they are going to seize the Capitol. And it wouldn't have been that hard to do. The Capitol had been dominated by Southern politicians and all of the people who worked for them, who were pro-Southern people, largely from Maryland and Virginia, and they thought it belonged to them. And if they had taken it over, they would have had a huge advantage before the Civil War even began. They would have controlled the capital of the United States, and I believe they would have called their new country the United States of America. They would have kept the name, and that would have made it immeasurably more difficult for Abraham Lincoln to save democracy and save what we think of as the United States of America. But the problem then, as now, was people had very different ideas about what constitutes the United States of, of America. And then to your question about roots and timing, yeah, if he'd gone too soon, he would land in the middle of this festering, angry city without enough to do. That wasn't too safe. If he goes too late, the city might have seceded in some ways, there, and Maryland was thinking about seceding. So he had to time it just right, and he had to plan this very winding route through northern capitals where he's building up political capital of, of his own before the final descent, in, in every sense, into Washington. Yeah, I think to that point, it's interesting that he doesn't choose to, you know, take the the quickest route or the necessarily even the safest route, but chooses a route that's going to be a, a very traditional what we might see in a campaign as a whistle stop tour, right? Where he's traveling across the country, and you you kind of document a number of these stops, even some of which we don't really have a lot of documentation for. Um, why? What was that component? Because that seems to be a separate motivation in a way to say, all right, I'm not just going to get from point A to point B in the safest and fastest way. I need to demonstrate something by, you know, in this intervening time, taking this long winding path. So that's absolutely right. It was a kind of campaign trip after he had already won, but that was necessary because he'd won with so feeble a result. He wins with less than 40 percent of, of the vote and a lot of northern people who do not vote for him and do not like him. So he's got to shore up his support in the north, even after winning. So the trip is basically designed to take him to northern state capitals, which are very important places because he's going to need support from every governor at a time when governors were very powerful. And if he needs soldiers to fight a war, he's hoping he won't need them. But of course, we know that he did need them. And he's going to have to ask the governor of each northern state to, to draft troops to defend Washington, D.C., which is extremely exposed, and send um, supplies, munitions, all kinds of other things to him. Um, but then as the trip starts, it changes. And I think they began to understand it better as they actually went into the trip. And Lincoln, as a young man, was reading these great 
books about journeys. He loved um, John Bunyan's A Christian, um, A Pilgrim's Progress, about a young man named Christian who goes on this kind of uh, long trip through a, an allegorical landscape. Um, he liked Homer's Odyssey, so I, I talk about the Odyssey in a few places, Don Quixote, and a great journey changes you as you're on it, and, and it doesn't always bring you to the place you think you're going to, and I think that was happening to Lincoln. So he had written out one big speech for each day, which would usually be in a, a legislature, but then as you're pointing out, the pressures of being on this moving train and, and huge crowds coming to every little stop, every small town, even a crossroads, he had to keep talking. And in those improvisatory moments, we can learn a lot about who Lincoln is. He, he has been silent for a year. He has won without giving a meaningful speech, which is amazing. You know, the greatest orator in American history has been silent throughout the year of campaigning and suddenly he's talking all the time and there are funny Lincoln speeches. There are sad Lincoln speeches. There are um, speeches in which he remembers his past in very interesting ways. And then he's working up this big message, which is we are all Americans together and we believe in the declaration of independence and in, in its message of equality and human rights. And that brings him very far to the famous Lincoln who we know from the history books, the Gettysburg Address Lincoln. So in these hurly-burly conditions, difficult travel, nearly being killed by people who, who like him, and also nearly being killed by people who hate him, he's growing tremendously. So that's, that's the drama of the book. Yeah, I, I definitely want to talk about some of that drama, the people who uh, tried to kill him, the uh, plots against him. Um, some of the other topics. One speech in particular, and I was really uh, um, taken, I thought this was interesting. You know, one of the final stops along the way is in Philadelphia, right? And he stops in Philadelphia. It's, I think that's pretty much on the final day of this trip before he heads, <laughs> right. you know, into Harrisburg and Baltimore. And while he's there, it's Washington's birthday. He speaks um, right there in Philadelphia in front of Independence Hall, I believe. And you write, and I thought this was really interesting that, and this is a quote, uh, historians looking for causes of the North's victory in 1865 could do worse than to study this morning in 1861. You're talking about the morning he's speaking in Philadelphia. Quote, when one, president's articul when one president articulated a vision for his country and the other, I assume Jefferson Davis, yes. said nothing. What, 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 what do you mean by that? I mean, is that it, there was something very significant about that speech for you when you were researching that, it. that speech grew and grew. I didn't know the book would be about that speech as, as much as it became, but it, it grew and grew for me, a, as did the experience of um, looking out the train window. For, for many years, I was writing a book just about Lincoln, but then I actually began with a conversation with an undergraduate. It's so nice here on a college campus to honor your teacher and I'm a teacher. And a student said, what is he seeing out the window? And I thought, what a, what a profound question. And then I began to fill in the gaps of what Cincinnati looks like, what Pittsburgh looks like. And they're all different. All these northern cities are, are not the same. But uh, yeah, that morning, February 22nd, 1861, I, I think it's a double win, win-win for Lincoln. And the first win is a little hard to see, but it allows us into his mind as a brilliant planner of an event that he's the actor. He's the stage manager and the actor of a production. And he's the Lynn Bolger of, of his own event. And um, he had the wisdom, and I assume it was him, to know that February 22nd is a really important day of the year. It's the second most sacred day for Americans after July 4th. And he arranged it so that the train would bring him to Independence Hall in Philadelphia, where the Declaration of Independence was signed, written and signed, and, and the Constitution was negotiated and, and signed. And so that is ground zero for American history, much more than this half-built city of Washington, D.C., which mainly stands for the limits of democracy. Philadelphia stands for the potential of democracy. And Jefferson Davis has a very interesting um, access to the Declaration of Independence if he chooses to take it, but he, he, he misses. He, he misses the opportunity. 
he has become the president of the Confederacy February 18th, so four days earlier. And there's a very strong link from his family. Um, he and his wife had were descendants of Revolutionary War officers, better lineage than Lincoln's in that respect. Um, and one of the main messages of the Declaration of Independence is if you don't like the government you're living under, you're free to start your own government. You might have thought Jefferson Davis might have taken advantage of that and said, here's why I love George Washington on his birthday, and here's why I love the Declaration of Independence. He doesn't say anything. And Lincoln had the intelligence to create the perfect stage for himself, which was Independence Hall, and then to knock it out of the park. And he comes in and says, I, every feeling I've ever had about politics um, stems from my reading of the Declaration of Independence. And I, I think the word feeling, and he also uses the word sentiment, those are important because he's making a kind of emotional argument as well as a rational argument. And he says that what it all means is that we are a country founded on equal rights. The Declaration of Independence might have simply been a, an announcement of a new country, or it might have been this more pro-Confederate idea that if you don't like your government, you can start a new one. But there's an even better message, which is that the best governments of all are coming. They're coming in the future, and they will be founded on an idea we are now going to test, which is that all people, I mean, they say all men, but they implied all men have certain unalienable rights, unalienable, they cannot be removed. Everyone has them, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain, with unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if all men have them, then all men of all racial complexions have them. And that means slavery is illegal and immoral and against the spirit of the main document of American history. And so Lincoln was saying something profound, which he then said again at the Gettysburg Address, and then he repeated it in a new way in the second inaugural. And that is why we love him. We do not love him because he won a military battle. We, we love him because he reminded us what was best in our own story. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, definitely one of the, the key threads that runs through Lincoln's rhetoric, um, I would definitely say, dating even back to before 1858, through to the point that you're writing about into Gettysburg, et cetera, is that focus on the Declaration. And there's some practical strategic reasons for that, not wanting to talk about the Constitution, yes. wanting to focus on the Declaration. Um, but there are also some, it's interesting, as you follow that line, you can also see his thinking evolve as he turns around what the meaning of that word is. And an interesting point, you know, about that question of what defines a, a man to begin with, right? right. The, the, the humanity um, of all, all people, regardless of, of their race. Um, not to turn away from, I think, what are very weighty considerations about the Declaration, but you did mention before about all of the threats to his life, right? So that there is this, his transformation as he is on the train, and I completely sympathize with, you know, I, I love trains as well. We're 19th century, you know, right. scholars. We're, we're nerds, it's, right. It's like train riding is what we do. Yeah. Um, and looking out and, and I, you know, around him, his own transformation, the, the importance of these speeches, but there is this practical consideration. And you document that, in fact, as he's progressing, he's getting more news about threats on his life, so that it's not, that's an evolving kind of situation. Right. There's been a lot of rumor and, and, uh, and stories, and they evolve, I mean, they emerge from that particular point of time. You know, the, the president snuck in under cover of darkness into Washington, D.C. Now, I don't want you to recount the entire part of that, but is there maybe there maybe the way to ask this was when you were doing this research, was there something that jumped out at you about that last little couple of legs of the trip in particular, where the danger was so heightened? And you really document that a harrowing in some instances kind of a journey at that point, that last little bit. Yes. Well, thank you. And I mean, I didn't intend at first to write the story of his near assassination, but that too was very powerful and you know, frankly, it made me feel better. I, I grew up uh, like so many children. I bet you were the same way reading about Lincoln. You can, you can fall in love with Lincoln and his sad features. And, and he, he, he did wrestle with depression his whole life. And then and there's the tragedy of his death. We all know about it. It's this very disturbing, violent act in the, the center of our history. And as I learn more about 
the nearness of this early assassination attempt and his success in avoiding it, I felt lifted up by it. I felt like he he got to do what he needed to do. He saved the United States and he saved even more what the United States means to the rest of the world, this higher ground that we want to be on. We don't want to be a selfish nation. We want to be a generous nation. And he, he gave that back to us. Um, so uh, the, the drama of the assassination was really important to the, to the last third of the book. And there are two stories happening at the same time. He's becoming deeper and better as a speaker. And he's hearing every night these terrible stories about how big the plot is of people who are ready to kill him in Baltimore. And then also if he gets through Baltimore in, in Washington at the moment of his first inauguration. And he has terrible decisions he has to make. And finally, he he hates to do this, but the the evidence is so overwhelming that he will be killed by a, a, a conspiracy of up to a thousand people in the streets of Baltimore as he's passing through that he decides to accept the advice of his security team and ride in a small passenger compartment on an ordinary commuter train going all night from Philadelphia through Baltimore to Washington. And that's the river of night that I described that Phil mentioned. And yeah, it really was harrowing. And then as soon as he survived that night, the press nearly killed him in a different sense and wrote all these false stories about how he'd been wearing a, a, a Scottish costume. But you, you asked what was new and what I learned. And I just want to say, I appreciated the incredible role of women in saving Lincoln's life. And women are a little hard to find in, in the Lincoln story, the Civil War story. They were everywhere, as, as you know. And good historians have reminded us of that over and over again. But I was so happy to find in this book I was writing that two women are really strong. Uh, Dorothea Dix, who was born in Maine, by the way, and becomes a mental health advocate. And here's the plot. Uh, after she's traveling through the South, and then a, an agent working with Alan Pinkerton to infiltrate the plot named Kate Warney, and she warns Lincoln's entourage in person. She's a phenomenal um, heroine of this story. So women save Lincoln's life. Yeah, the Kate Warney story actually for me was, okay, that's great. I need another new research project. Right? <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. This is all I need right now. I had now. to a stop new, a myself. New to a new topic to I go mean, down a rabbit hole. This ball. very long book might have been three times as long. And fortunately, I had an editor. Yeah, so. I was like, who, who's written her story? Right? <laughs> right, like, right. Like, because like, that, that entire, because, you know, people have heard of Pinkerton and, you know, everyone, you know, has talked about that and there's a lot been written, but the Kate Warney story about not just infiltrating the plot and doing essentially kind of because she was a woman kind of fading into the background and being able to pick up on the plot, but then right. particularly protecting him. Right. So for, you know, telling the, the conductors not to come into the car so that right. no one would know he's on the train. Exactly. Not to spoil too much folks, but uh, there's, there's a lot about that. Um, all right. So one of the things that you, let's go back to the speeches for a second, because I think that, you know, you mentioned uh, at some point that, you know, by most estimates, this 12 day period, this trip that he's on, he probably gives 101 speeches, you know, short speeches, whistle stop type of things. Right. Some of which we have some extant copies of, some that we don't. You know, I, as you know, my background is in oratory and speeches. It's kind of how I get into Lincoln to begin with. And I'm really curious because, and maybe we can begin to pivot a little bit to talk about to, to the day. Um, part of the thesis or part of the theme that I read you writing about is the importance of the speeches, right? That him talking to audiences, both for his own uh, development and thinking things out by talking about them, but also building political capital um, for that he's going to need. You know, as someone who has also has a background, you know, in speech writing, is that is that different today? I mean, and I, and I guess my question thinking about today's world is, have we, have we passed by the, the world of oratory, right? Like, do speeches matter anymore? Is in the, in the world of the Twitterverse and kind of uh, clipped cable news, constant feeds and streaming and all of this, is there still a role for speech making um, and, and even in this upcoming campaign? It, it has changed a lot in just a few years. And even though I'm a Democrat, uh, I, I, I want to say that Donald Trump discovered some really important new ways of communicating. I mean, there's no doubt that he did. Even if you disagree with his message, he 
discovered what Twitter could mean for a politician better than, I mean, the hundreds and thousands of federal, state, local politicians. And suddenly this guy comes out of left field in the 2016 campaign and is working the social media like no one ever has. And so I think he, future specialists in oratory, ought to give him some credit for that. And he also is very talented at giving a speech most of us do not like, but it, it is an impressive performance, um, the rally speech. So that's usually associated with a campaign. He's been campaigning long after winning his own election. So he, I don't think he's very brave about going into blue states. In fact, he's, he's not brave at all. But he still goes out there and until the coronavirus, um, he was giving a lot of rally speeches and they are impressive performances. He stands up there for a long time, seemingly with no script. I don't think he needs a script. He can just talk and talk and talk, almost like William Jennings Bryan. It's sort of like something out of a populism that was more linked with the left wing than the right wing at the time of William Jennings Bryan. However, having said those nice things about Donald Trump, he's remarkably bad at giving any kind of a serious speech. He's terrible at a policy speech. You might remember he gave a televised speech from the Oval Office about the beginning of the coronavirus. It was awful. And I almost think, and I'm not trying to be mean, I almost think he cannot read normally. I think he might have some dyslexia because he his eyes glaze over and he he doesn't stop at the end of the sentence. He, he, he The words jumble together. So as good as he is at a rally speech, he's very limited at giving um, a, a written speech, whether it's on the teleprompter or even worse on the printed page, that he doesn't like to hold the printed page. Um, so... He's a complicated speaker, I think, with Joe Biden, who has his own weaknesses as a speaker, but also some some strengths, which, you know, in some ways are similar. to. I, I think reading a formal document is a little hard for Joe Biden, but he's better at it. Um, he's pretty good giving a long stem winder speech the way um, Donald Trump does. But I think Joe Biden, if he wins, will be comfortable with the Oval Office address, which is a very important kind of speech. And we need to calm down. We need to be one country again, accepting the right of dissent and working together to solve a national crisis. I mean, we have several. And we need a calm speaker from the Oval Office to tell us what are our higher values as a country and then what are our marching orders? What are our instructions? How do we behave? How do we get through this pandemic that we are not at all through? Yeah, it's it's interesting about that the genre, particularly the genre of the the speaker giving the speech now as the president, or in this case, what you're writing about Lincoln as the president elect, right? So not yet inaugurated, um, and about to be inaugurated, and giving these speeches around, particularly around obviously around the North, um, advocating for kind of unity or common ground or principled kind of re, re um, inscribing of the American tradition. I do think it's um, how would I. I'm wondering if there's an analog, like, are we going to see something similar and to the topic of the Champlain Institute this year um, after the election and this coming November? Meaning, is there a space for that? I, I, I often have students, I, I was teaching my presidential elections class this past spring. One of my students in particular had said, you know, I know you study the 1850s, 1860s, uh, and they were a little afraid to ask, what's the comparison here? And I, I'm often conflicted saying, well, in a way, Lincoln's attempt to keep the country together failed, right? Like it, it true, failed. True. And so, you know, is this, it, can we, I guess maybe, can we take anything from Lincoln on the verge about how in this intervening, whoever wins the presidential election in the intervening period, and it's a shorter period now, but in that intervening period, what would be what would be the um, the takeaway for for a candidate who wants to bring the country together? Well, when I started this book, I had no idea we'd be in this predicament. Um, I started it in 2011, as, as I said, with those newspaper pieces, which stayed with me. That's a sign as a historian that you've you know you know we're we're not that smart. We we like everything, as you said. We want to research everything that has ever happened and. You can go down a um, rabbit hole with a bad topic for years. and But this f 
stayed with me. I thought, wow, that train trip was really interesting. And I'd like to read more about it. So I, I think I landed on a good topic, but I had no idea it would be relevant to current events in 2020. And I, I do think that it is. Um, I did not see Donald Trump coming as a candidate. I did not see him winning. I got all of that totally wrong. He was a reality television uh, actor when, when I started the book. Um, but Lincoln is basically the anti-Trump, which makes Trump's continual effort to link himself to Lincoln really awkward. In my, I mean, they couldn't see two people more different, even though they're both in the same Republican Party. But um, in every one of these speeches that you mentioned, Lincoln always removes himself from the equation. He says, look, we're all one people. There's an amazing moment when he's looking out at the Ohio River from southern Ohio toward Kentucky. And he's born in Kentucky. He's a kind of a southerner. And he says, you know what I think about people from Kentucky and from the South? I think you are every bit as good as we are. And you don't have to worry. I'm going to treat you well. I'm going to honor all of your rights. We can get through this together. There's no evidence that we are going to get through this together, to use the phrase of the last uh, five months un under Donald Trump. His entire politics is about separating Am Americans. And it's always about putting himself first and the country second. With Lincoln, you almost never hear him use the first person. He doesn't like words like I or me. He likes to talk about what America stands for, what we need to do to calm things down and, and get through this. Um, he's experimenting, as, as you know very well, he's experimenting with ways to keep the South in the Union in this really hard transition and is saying a lot that I will not touch slavery in the southern states where it is protected by the Constitution. What he what he says that enrages the South is I do not want you to expand slavery into the West and by extension into the North where there was a lot of evidence, the Dred Scott decision being Exhibit A, that the South was going to shove slavery into every community in the United States, including Maine. Um, that's where it was going if you study Dred Scott. And Lincoln and a lot of other people said, no way. We're, we're sick of you dictating your conditions to the rest of us as a country. And, and so um, he had a moral backbone. And that's another place where I'd say he's quite different from the current president. And he saw where America needed to go if it was going to stay an inspiring country to other nations. And it was you know, a, a racial caste system was not going to make it in a sophisticated world that in every other place, almost every other place, was moving away from that. You mentioned the uh, attempt by Lincoln during this period of time, and, and we see it pretty explicitly in the first inaugural, but in other places to try to reach out and to um, prevent, you know, the growing secession crisis. One of the questions that we got from one of the folks in the chat um, was this question is, when did Lincoln consider that he might be a wartime president. We may never fully know that, um, you know, he was going to uh, be a, confronting this, that it was not, that, that it was his efforts to try to prevent it from happening were going to be, to fall on deaf ears, essentially. Yeah. At what point, do, do we know at what point it became clear to him this is where things were going to be going, regardless of what he did? I think he was a work in progress, and that was another um, meaning of my title, Lincoln on the Verge, is he's not quite fully formed. He's not quite perfect. He's not quite president yet, but he makes mistakes. He's a human being, and I, I was very attracted to that part of Lincoln, that he's not this guy etched in stone in the Lincoln Memorial, but a flesh and blood guy moving through America on a fast train giving some bad speeches along with some great speeches. Um, and I think he was a little naive that a, a huge military um, contest was coming. I mean, we, we have some evidence that he's, he's going into meetings with all these governors. He's probably saying to them, I'm going to need your help to raise some soldiers if it comes to that. But probably all they were thinking was, we need to protect our northern, our, our, our U.S., excuse me, our, our American forts and installations that happen to be in southern states we will need some troops to guard them 
And I don't think he or anyone saw the total war, four years of total war that was coming. And I also don't think at the beginning of the Civil War, he saw Emancipation Proclamation and he looks a little bit short-sighted. And, you know, there are people who don't like Lincoln from the right. There are still people who are strong states' rights, pro-Confederate people who hate Lincoln. Um, he also gets criticized from the left. And I, I had a problem with the 1619 project of the New York Times, even though I really loved the passion and I loved many of the essays. They're beautifully written. But Lincoln, I thought, was mistreated. He, he's only cited uh, in, in moments where he looks like a guy with a racial blind spot. And, and he did have a racial blind spot, but he worked through his racial blind spot and, and got a lot more open and then becomes an abolitionist. He's often accused of not being one. And then with emancipation becomes the most successful abolitionist in our history to that point. And Frederick Douglass, who had a pretty solid idea what was happening, and, and I, I don't know anyone who observed these events more carefully, gave really important um, reminiscences about this complicated man and how he worked through his racial blind spot. Uh, after Lincoln was killed, Douglas gave a few speeches about him. And I, I think that's a better way of talking about him. And it draws in more white and black Americans into the story and how we all work through our, our deficiencies. We, we've all got them. Yeah, I mean, I think a conversation about Lincoln's evolution on the question of race and equality would be, we would be here for hours, if not days. We would, um, we would be. It's definitely, a, it's an interesting topic. And I, I've always appreciated the sense that Lincoln in some respects, because of, again, you, you mentioned the fact that children growing up in the United States read about Lincoln. Lincoln's become this almost mythology and icon that through the decades reflects where the country is. And so in many ways, kind of, it, it becomes this, this foil or this uh, litmus test for crises in the country, whether or not it's in the 1920s or the 1950s, the 1970s, or even today. Um, you mentioned earlier, and I want to go back because I we've got a couple more minutes, and I want to make sure to get questions from the chat. You you had mentioned earlier about the comparison or to Jefferson Davis, and uh, that on Washington's birthday, Lincoln gave this speech in Philadelphia on his way to D.C. Um, Jefferson Davis was silent. One of the folks in, in the asked this question as to whether or not um, one of, one of the folks in the in the chat asked whether or not Lincoln had ever really explicitly compared his situation to Jefferson Davis, whether or not he had. Uh, talked about his background versus Davis's background. I, I also just, and we can throw in there, I know that he was actually pretty close with the vice president of the Confederacy. Yes. Uh, and that's a different story altogether. Maybe we can talk about as well. But in terms of Lincoln's comparing himself to Jefferson Davis, is that something we have evidence for at all? Or I'm not aware of it. It, it is an interesting question. Um, they're both born in Kentucky and then their lives are very different. Jefferson gets to go to college. Um, he's got an older brother who really takes good care of him. And he goes to West Point and he has this gl glittering career in Washington. He's secretary of war. He's a officer in the Mexican war. And then he's a senator from Mississippi. And Lincoln is a failure in every way compared to Davis up till that point. But they diverge in other ways. And, and that sh starts to show Lincoln as a stronger person. And, and Lincoln is, without any college education, really reading carefully in the founders, I think more carefully than Davis did. I, I'm, I'm not very impressed. I've, I've read a lot of Davis, actually. Um, his familiarity with the founding documents, not, not very impressive. His, his speeches are not very good. He, he gives an inaugural address. It's second rate, in my opinion. And um, He's just sort of saying the Declaration of Independence does not apply to African-Americans. Lincoln's saying, oh, yes, it does. It applies to all men. And so Lincoln has found his higher ground, even though society hasn't admired him as much. He's had lower political offices, and um, he's from a more rustic background than Davis. But he's figured out what is the, the, the best story about America. And he just stays with that. And that elevates him. And again, it's the moral compass. It's like knowing yourself and knowing the, the best people we can be. And, you know, I, I'm friends with many Southerners. You're a Southerner, 
Jamie, and I love the South. And when I read as a kid about the Civil War, I had a bit of uh, confusion about which side was better. I, I, you know, six, seven, eight years old, it's just these two armies fighting each other. It's hard to, to know. But the lost cause is not a good cause. It's just not that heroic a, a, a cause to start your epic struggle um, based on. It's based on racism and um, not great toward women and not great toward immigrants and not great toward inventiveness and innovation. And that began to be a military disadvantage. And in the South, you know, lost for a lot of reasons. And Lincoln became a better man than Jefferson Davis for a lot of reasons. He knew who he was. So um, I, I, I'd love to study Davis more. I'm interested in some stories. There's some very interesting slaves on the Davis plantation who were quite talented. And I'm interested in Alexander Stevens, as you mentioned, and Lincoln and he are friends and Stevens becomes the vice president. And he tells his fellow Georgians, you're out of your minds. Don't secede. The North is going to kill us. They secede anyway. And then they elect him vice president and he's stuck. But th that's a fascinating story. Yeah. It's, it's also, you note that in fact, he is, he and Lincoln are having, are exchanging correspondence even during this period of time. And so this idea that Lincoln would be in correspondence with essentially the vice president of the Confederacy over, you know, the humanity of enslaved individuals in this country. Right. You know, what does that say for today? Right. Does that that idea because we, we hear about all today. I, I was really one thing you said very early on was this idea that in Washington, D.C., politicians would move or it wasn't they were socially distancing because of COVID. They were socially right. distancing because right. the partisan animosity they, was they, so much that they couldn't. And be we heard about that other. last night a little bit, too. Yeah. Huh? There was a civility. You could disagree, but be friends. And Lincoln and Stevens are friends, but it was getting really bad. And, 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 and most people could not be friends after the war started. Sure. Yeah. And I imagine, you know, it would be very difficult to maintain a friendly relationship with someone who denied the humanity of another person. Right. right? I mean, you were basically saying these are not men. That's right. Uh, and at some point we can talk about the need for civility, but there has to, I suspect, even for every individual, a breaking point of that's just not acceptable. We were hitting the breaking point in 1860. We hit it and went past it and had a, you know, the most brutal war in our history. And in a sense, so brutal a war that we are still fighting it. And so it has come back in all these amazing ways in the last six months. We, we had a question about that. Jonathan Livingstone asks, um, and this may be directed towards you, Ted. So, you know, when you look out the train window right now, metaphorically, or maybe actually, um, what are you seeing? And, and what do you think, you know, maybe Lincoln would say or do or give advice for, again, after the election is over, after the votes are counted, however long that's going to take? What, it, what would be the advice or maybe your advice or his advice or, or something that would speak to how we move forward either divided or united or wrestling with tough issues? Um, well, I would say there are good people out the train window in every community in this country, in red states and in blue states. And they're, they're commingled in every community. You know, our reddest states have, have great blue people and our bluest states have great red-leaning uh, red people. I, I, I didn't say it quite right. Um, but it's really important to play by the rules. We have rules. The founders wrote our rules and we've um, amended them as we needed to. And when an election is over, we count the votes and someone wins. And if your side lost, you have to accept it and you will have another chance to run again. And I'm worried we're heading into a transition where if Donald Trump loses, he will not accept the verdict and, and our system may break down. So we need we need people who love their country from all political backgrounds to say the rules are important. It's like a basketball game or a football game. And we'll have another chance. We'll have another um, game to play in four years. But also one thing Lincoln said that was very impressive always was we're not just a country here in these states, now 50. We are kind of a role model for, for everybody. And democracy is very weak around the world. In Europe, it was weak in, in, the, in 1861 and, and in Asia and Africa. And if we believe in this system and if we admire our founders, we need to show how well we inherit the plan. And, and we'll, sure, we'll fix the problems, but we'll hand it off to our children in an even better way. 
because it's not just democracy in, in the United States we're trying to protect, but we want it to work for all people on earth have the right and the capacity to govern themselves. And so if we screw up, we're screwing it up for now seven, eight, nine billion people. So we have a heavy responsibility to live up to. Maybe the answer then at the end of the day is we need more trains so people can be looking yeah. at the train. <laughs> Just to be you know, honest, like that see, kind of. You know, there used to be like cafe cars. You could sit down with someone like in the movie North by Northwest and just have a conversation. Oh, I, and get off your social media. I think Lincoln would tell us to, to talk to people who are different and to learn from new sources because social media is making everybody crazy. Yeah, there's a, and just as a final party note, very early in the book, you quote this amazing quote I had not seen before from the New York Times about the Telegraph and the worry that the Telegraph was going so fast that the information right. was coming too fast to fact check it. And right. so this idea of virality and disinformation spread right. was a problem in 1859 and 1858. It, it sure was. The telegraph. I mean, there were ways to handle fast information well, and Lincoln did it. Lincoln was a beneficiary of the telegraph because his, his great speeches are going all around the country. And people are like, yeah, that makes sense. He's a real person. But even then, there was a small danger of mistakes getting out there, including the false story about how he snuck in wearing a disguise. So he, he was hurt a little bit by fast news also. Fantastic. All right, Ted, it's been great having you. Uh, Lincoln on the Verge, I really enjoyed reading this and I have to read a lot of Lincoln books, let's be honest. I'm sure. Um, as you do too. But this really, for me, opened up a lot of new spaces and I really appreciate you joining us. I'm gonna turn things back over to Lynn Bolger now and uh, for what's coming up next. Great, thank you, Jamie. Thank you both for that wonderful session and uh, lessons on leadership from Lincoln. Um, previous sessions will be available on the website coa.edu backslash c-i-v-i-e-w. That's coa.edu c-i-v-u. And join us tonight for our next session at 5 p.m., with Abdi Noor Iftin and Francis Stead Sellers, who will be talking about Abdi's immigration story, which is remarkable, and his book, Call Me American. Thanks. See you then.